everybody and welcome to this webinar. I hope you find it an interesting and unique experience. I'm Dr. Sisi Vartel Galo, and I'm at the beautiful center of the Asia Society in Hong Kong. The executive director of the center, Ms. Alice Mong, will be the moderator for today. And the speaker, Professor Guy Bar Oz, will give his talk from the campus of the University of Haifa in Israel. So we're quite an international webinar today. Before we start, Professor Ron Robin, the president of the University of Haifa, would like to say a few welcoming words. So let's begin. Greeting distinguished guests all the way from Haifa here. We are talking to you in Hong Kong. I'd like to thank the Asia Society and Ronnie Chan in particular for hosting this webinar. You probably know the University of Haifa as an, an institute of higher learning, but we also have great educational programs online for the public so that we can promote the knowledge and understanding and bridge between the different cultures and backgrounds just as we're doing today. So we'll invite the audience to reach out to the university uh, through our online tours, but we look forward once border restrictions will ease to see you here in Haifa and take you to see the many archeological sites where we are present. So today's webinar is from Extension to Market, New Frontiers in Bioarchaeology. We all know that uh, China and Israel lay at the two ends of the ancient and modern Silk Roads. For millennia, goods have traveled from one corner to the other, connecting disparate worlds into one and heralding the physical travel of people in the presence. These trade routes foreshadow the process of globalization that affect each and every one of us every day in very interesting and profound ways. The diversity of imported products in our food is a strong testimony for such past and present economic structures. There is also evidence in the archaeological record to this, of course. Recently, we have reported that University of Haifa archaeologists have founded imported silk fabrics in the Negev Desert. Some may have come all the way from China. This is the first evidence of the Israeli Silk Road. So, hybrid archaeology at our university uh, is at the frontier of archaeological science in the world. The me methods that they have developed to study the ancient past are cited everywhere. They're acknowledged worldwide. Our leading archaeologists are frequently involved in applying scientific techniques from the natural and exact sciences to the analysis of archaeological material. The scientific community here at our university is comprised of bioarchaeologists, biologists who specialize in genetics, bioinformatics, and computer scientists. With this breadth and depth of expertise, we plan to establish a hybrid research hub that aims to extract knowledge from extinct genomes and transform it for the benefit of contemporary society. We believe that by capitalizing on a new wave of technological breakthroughs, we have the ability to crack the code of ancient deteriorating genomes and actively revive and restore lost authentic breeds of animals and plant varieties. Thank you so much for joining us today at this webinar. We hope to see you soon in person. Shalom from Haifa. Thank you, Thank you. Professor uh, Ron Robin for that wonderful uh, introduction and thank you Cece for that wonderful uh, introduction as well. I am Alice Mong, Executive Director of Asia Society Hong Kong Center and it is really um, a delight for me to be moderating uh, today's discussion from extinction to market, new frontier in bioarchaeology. And we're really delighted that Professor Guy Par Oz, uh, archaeologist, Department of Archaeology at University of Haifa is with us. Uh, professor uh, uh, Bar Oz is a professor of archaeology. Uh, he holds academic degrees in biology, archaeology, ecology, zoology, and did his postdoctoral research in anthropology at Harvard University. In 2010, he was a visiting professor at the Smithsonian Institute at Washington, D.C., and at 2018 at the University of so so Sokantai in Japan. His research focuses on the cultural and biological heritage of the ancient lands. Ancient of land. His research team is a hub for collaborative scientific network with strong foundation in anthropological and biological research. 
His main research efforts deal with uh, the developing and applying novel methods for reconstructing in high resolution um, the, cultural, the culture and environmental landscape of its extinct past societies. In the past few years, his main research concentrates on human impact on ancient environments and collapse and the resilience of past societies in marginal environments. Uh, he is currently the head of the Negev Byzantine Bioarchaeology Research Program, which investigates the causes for the collapse of the Byzantine society in Negev uh, circa 50, uh, 1,500 years ago. The project bears crucial implication for present day concerns with sustainable development. It also addresses a dual problem. How were uh, Byzantines, Byzantines able, able to uh, erect a flourishing infrastructure in the Negev desert and why did they eventually fail? So it's our great honor to, prof uh, to welcome Professor Guy bar -Oz. Professor? Thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you very, very much. I think uh, Mr. Ronnie Chang and Miss Alice Wong and the organizers of the Asia Society for inviting me to speak in front of your leading educational organization today. Preparing this talk was a great opportunity for me to organize my thoughts and rethink how my data can be understood in a broader framework that relates to my occupation as an archeologist. My topic for this brief presentation touches on connections between the biology and the biology of ancient and extinct plant varieties and the archeology span of the ancient land of Israel during the period of early Christianity. I began to prepare my talk by asking myself, why is archeology span important? This is not a straightforward question, especially not during the ongoing coronavirus pandemic in periods when international solidarity is threatened and in times of global economic crisis. But still, it was important for me to clarify why should we invest in archeology? span Why should we learn about our past? I will give you my answer. For us, archeology span is a mission to reconstruct human knowledge of the past much of which is lost. Significant amounts of such human, humanity's lost knowledge is frequently held in the palm of our bare ends. In many times they are capsulate in small pieces. These desiccated food leftovers usually comprise of plant seed and animal bones. Each piece is a data bank, an archive of valuable genetic traits of ancient livestock and crops that were selected and bred for centuries. Many of them were forgotten and lost to humanity due, pro, due to prolonged periods of deep social and economic decline. It is our responsibility as archeologists to search for these heirloom varieties, to study them with state-of-the-art scientific tools and to bring them back to life. The novelty of this approach is the concept that we call it from extinction to market. Its objective is to pioneer the use of advanced ancient DNA technology to revive and restore lost plant and animal species that add great commercial value in antiquity. By harnessing the power of these long extinct taxa, we can use some of these archeological treasures to develop a more sustainable society in the future. The land of Israel has always been extremely diverse in its crops and livestock. The depth of the country's archeological record and the bank of heritage that it's coded in the material culture with its rich archeological finds makes Israel one of the richest cultural archives for flora and fauna. 
alongside only a handful of other regions where agriculture was first developed, it remained an important center for plant and animal domestication for millennia. We will develop and demonstrate this concept with several examples in the following slides. In this talk, we will take a short journey from the first millennium in ancient Israel. For that, we will travel for about 8,000 kilometers from East Asia to Israel that is, located on the other, that is located on the other end of the continent. We can make our trip by walking along several main routes across the Asian spheres. These roads, also generally known as the Silk Road, a network of trade roads that connected the East and the West for more than 2,000 years. For example, we can follow the footsteps of Marco Polo, the most renowned Western traveler of Central and East Asia that explored the Silk, that explored the Silk Road in the 13th century. In, 12, in 1271, Marco Polo sailed from Venice to the city of Acre in, the, in Northern Israel and made, Acre, and made Acre the starting point for his great journey to the East. The journey took him more than two years until he reached China. The Arbor of Acre can be easily seen from where we are located now at the top of Eshkol Tower at the University of Haifa on the top of Mount Carmel. Just to give you an impression, the distance between the Arbor of Acre and the university is less than the air distance from Hong Kong airport to Victoria Arbor. In addition, many of the famous world heritage sites of early Christianity are located nearby in the Galilee and the adjacent Jezreel Valley. In this talk, we will focus on the Negev Desert of Southern Israel with its hyper-harried climate that served as a melting pot for early Christian agricultural society. It is important to note the uniqueness of the first millennium in the land of Israel. This is a period in time when Judaism consolidated, Christianity developed, and Islam emerged. It is a time in human history of immense creativity and novelty, specifically the period between the third to the seventh century was a time in history when culture was very much influenced from the Jewish values. It was a perfect time, very much like the present day, when there was harmony between innovation and ideology. This gave the people the wisdom and vision, not just doing things for themselves, but also in creating new environments, in making society better and in, impro and in improving life. We witnessed these changes in many aspects of the daily life of Jewish and early Christian societies of that time. The massive social complexity and creativity of the period is most profoundly demonstrated by the expanding agricultural lifeways to new territories, including to hostile and arid environment like the Negev Desert and adopting new cultivation and farming techniques. The ingenuity of those desert people to farm the barren land is demonstrated in the book of Isaiah, and I quote, the desert become a fertile field and the fertile field seems like a forest. Our aim in this talk is to briefly present the results from our ongoing excavation in the Negev and to use them to revive the ancient agricultural landscape. With, with this, we wish to explore new ways to reconstruct and restore some of the extinct crops and animals that were selected and bred in this desert landscape. Specifically, we will focus on the thousands of grape seeds that were among the, that were among the most surprising discoveries of our expedition. The Negev Desert also operated during this time as a critical artery for commerce, linking Asia and Europe, possibly representing the first era of true economic globalization. Exported commodities and luxury goods 
such as textile, textile, spices, and fish were moving between East Asia, Arabia, and the Mediterranean. Remains of Indian Ocean parrotfish, together with imported silk and cotton fabrics recently found in our excavation, offer unparalleled clues to document the commercial connection of the region and its importance of international trade more than 1,500 years ago. The virus long distance imported goods also enable to raise key questions regarding the spread of technologies, the spread of people and products that fuel the intense, that fuel intense international commerce across the Asian spheres. Furthermore, recent advances in paleogenetics and the new hybrid archaeological approach that we are promoting, together with valuable data sets of ancient agriculture and imported goods, raise growing interests among modern stakeholders to commercialize extinct authentic crop and cultivars. The planted animals that, that were selected and bred for centuries in the arid environment of the Negev Desert are particularly important to understand human resilience during periods of climate change. It is precisely through this type of research that important piece of humanity's lost knowledge can be found. Our research efforts strongly, strongly rely on synergy between researchers with different skills and resources from humanities and the natural and exact sciences. It is a hybrid archeological approach, which is represented by four pillars of bioarcheology. The archeological finds that allow us to materialize and feel the past. Historical texts that provide written descriptions of events, memories, and new discoveries of ancient communities. Biology that studies the, or the organic remains from archaeological sites and, examined the, and examines the development and change of plants and animals over time. And palogenetics that enable us to identify specific characteristics and genetic traits of livestock and plants cultivation in the past. In the next few minutes, we will tour our excavation in the Negev to provide you with a brief overview of the local environment of the Negev Desert and to show you the type of bioarchaeological material that we found in our project. Following that, we will zoom out across the Negev and beyond to take a broader perspective to explore global connectivity and long distance marketing of goods. The main research question that we wish to answer is, how did the Negev people succeed in developing agriculture in the arid desert? Keep in mind that the Negev is a hyper, hyper arid area, that the climate there is in the last 2000 years was not at all different from today. Presently, the area receives less than 100 millimeters of rain per year on average. This is about four inches of rain for the whole year. With this limiting environment, the agricultural settlers of the Negev that lived there between the fourth to the seventh centuries undertook major urban and agricultural development on a scale unknown in this area previously or since. Permanent settlements and agriculture, and agriculture in the Negev then declined in subsequent centuries, eventually leaving the region sparsely inhabited almost until the modern era. These early agricultural communities portray a unique case of greening the desert in antiquity. This exceptional phenomena reached its peak with the emergence of, Christ of Christianity as a state region and the rising significance of the Holy Land. It's important to realize that these questions, that the question we present here are relevant not just for the Negev, but to a much broader geographic scale in many more arid environments. Note that a significant part of the Byzantine Empire of that time was located in marginal areas like the Negev. 
Thus, agriculture in the arid landscape and the triumph to conquer and master unfriendly barren landscape was a major achievement of that time. I turn your attention to a satellite photo showing the Byzantine town of Shifta and its surrounding. First, you can observe the aridity of the landscape. Bear in mind that most of the countryside is extremely barren and dry. The only vegetation is primarily concentrated in patches in the drainage channels. It is there where the Byzantine farmers constructed agriculture constructed agricultural terraces for collecting the limited and unpredictable amount of rainfall. Note also the location of garbage dumps that are found outside of the city wall inside the settlement. We had documented sealed houses, sealed and intact houses that remained untouched after they were abandoned. In each of these contexts, the agricultural fields, the garbage dumps and the houses in the village we excavated and collected a series of biological remains to obtain, comprehensive, to obtain a comprehensive picture of the interaction between social and environmental processes. Let us take a brief look at the site of Shifta. One of our interesting discoveries here concerned the phenomena of the sealed doors. We documented 21, stru 21 structures with clear evidence of intentional barricading of the entrances as seen on the slide on the right side. As you can see in these examples, most sealed doors are completely blocked by stones. This phenomena emphasize the enigma of the ultimate collapse of the agricultural negative society that our research project explores. The distribution of the sealed house is marked on the map in purple. The fact that the houses are locked in the, that are, are, are located in the center of the village tentatively suggests an organized process of abandonment. In other Byzantine abandoned, abandoned houses, we find floors covered with trash, where our analysis showed that the trash was dated to the succeeding people that li lived in the site. These early Islamic trash dumps in abandoned Byzantine houses are marked in brown stars on the map. On the other end, we found that Byzantine period trash mounds are restricted to be outside of the settlement, and they are marked in blue stars and can be seen on the bottom left, on the bottom left corner of the map. Interestingly, many of the sealed houses are located in the center of the village facing the pools and the southern church. These houses are comparatively large structures extending over an entire block, indicated, indicating that they belonged to a wealthier residence of the sites. The precise timing of, abandonment, of the abandonment event is not yet clear. However, it is clear that understanding the dynamics of occupation and to differentiate between periods of continuity versus abandonment is a crucial component in reconstructing the broader pictures of the negative collapse. The sealed houses of Shifta are a fascinating example of how archaeology breathes life into ancient objects and our incomplete knowledge of human history. Our excavation in two of these abandoned houses going through the destruction debris down to the floor, show that the floors are overlain by Byzantine shards. Importantly, this, in, this indicates that the abandonment event took place during the Byzantine period, although some occupation of the settlements continue also afterwards. With additional houses going out of use and being turned into areas for trash accumulation, in the early Islamic period, it appears that occupation intensity continued to decline at that time. We also excavated early Islamic trash dumps in additional domestic structures near, near the center of the settlement. 
This example, an excavation of an early Islamic trash dump, demonstrate the rich array of bioarchaeological remains, which include textile fragments, abundant fruits, and seeds and exported fish from the Red Sea and shellfish from the Nile. Here is another example from excavation in another garbage dump located outside the boundary of another urban settlement in the Negev. As seen on the bottom left side of the slide, the dumps are easily recognized by the abundant pottery fragments on their surface. The vast majority of pottery are wine jugs, wine amphora. The dumps are also extremely rich in organic remains that are collected through sifting the excavated sediments. Among the many crop, the many crop species found in the Byzantine Negev trash mounds, we found plenty of wheat and barley and, and wheat and barley, legumes, fruit and nuts. Significantly, grapes are second only to barley, indicating their importance to the subsistence economy of the region. We will return to that in a, few, in a few slides. The diversity of the plant found in of the plant found include all seven all the seven species, the seven agricultural products which are listed in the Hebrew Bible as being the special product of the land of Israel. The results of our excavation in the agricultural fields show that sustainable farming was reached when it, when, it, when it included five essential components that allowed farming in the arid landscape of the Negev. First, they built thousands of stone mounds on the surrounding hills to enhance, to enhance floodwater runoff. Then they constructed terraces in the riverbed to catch the floods. In addition, water reservoirs were cut to collect rain, rain overflows. Near them, pigeon towers were, were built primarily for pigeon raising. Let me, let's see, let's see now each of the system component separately. In this photo, you can see the landscape on the slopes of the ravines enclosing the ancient fields of Shifta. They are, they are uncovered with thousands of small mounds made of surface fieldstones. These were constructed by local farmers to enhance the collections of soil alluvium and flood water to the agricultural fields below. The constructing terraces along the river bed enabled the inhabitants of the Negev to catch the, the alluvium, the alluvium soil and flood and flood, and flood water that arrived from the slopes. In a good flood event, you can catch the equivalent amount of about 150 to 200 millimeters of precipitation in a single event, which is more than the double than the annual rainfall for the region. You wouldn't need more than three such events, one at the end of the autumn, one in the midwinter, and another one in the early spring to achieve the equivalent amount of rainfall in Jerusalem situated in, Ju in the Judean mountains to the north. Such amount of rainfall, such amount of water would, would allow to plant orchards and vineyards in the wadis. Another important component for sustainable desert agriculture is the use of fertilizer. This is especially important in areas like the Negev, where the local soils are extremely poor in nutrients. Our studies show that the Negev farmers achieved sustainable soil, soil improvement by raising pigeon and using their manure as, as fertilizer in the field. It is important to note that the results, that results from laboratory analysis show trace amounts of pigeon manure in soil samples from nearby agricultural fields. In this photo, you can see a student sitting in one of these excavated pigeon towers. Note the triangular stone construction, each was designed to fit a pair of pigeons. 
Together, each tower could have housed more than 1,000 pigeons. Calculation of manual, of manual production show that a single pigeon tower could produce up to 10 tons of manual per year. Based on information from Roman agronomists and traditional Middle Eastern agriculturalists, we estimate that this amount would have been sufficient for several thousands of fruit trees. We also know from both historical and modern sources that pigeon manure is especially optimal for vineyards. Thus far, we have documented more than a dozen such pigeon towers that are arranged in a clear pigeon belt in the interland of the Negev sites. This further demonstrates the symbiosis between the pigeon and the vines in the early days of Christianity in the Negev. Pigeon decoration at the entrance of Shifta Northern Church vividly show this as association. Most importantly, a pigeon tower is also a great archaeological time capsule for super-preserved organic remains. Indeed, their excavation yielded massive amounts of biological remains. These include complete skeletons of pigeon, pigeon eggs, and eye abundances of plant remains that were brought by the pigeon either for nesting or as food. Preliminary analysis of grape seeds indicate the good preservation of DNA, indicating the potential of ancient DNA studies in the negative. In fact, recently we succeeded to crack the genetic code of some of these ancient grape seeds. Our initial data positively showed that the ancient seeds from the Negev genetically grouped with a cluster of lost indigenous grape cultivars. Today, we find these only in the wild in different parts of Israel. The implications are that we are well on the way to be able to locate and recreate this authentic heirloom variety. We hope to plant the first restored grove in modern Negev vineyards within a year or so of further work. The core innovation value of this project is the concept that we call it from extinction to market. Its objective is to pioneer the use of advanced ancient DNA technology to restore extinct cultivar and bring them back to the market. Similar to our efforts to reconstruct old grape cultivars, we, we also study old olive trees that, survive, that survived in Byzantine agricultural fields and are still growing today. One example is seen on this slide. The middle photo showed the tree during excavation where we collected samples from its old roots in order to date the tree. MicroCity was used to conduct detailed morphological tests. It also allowed us to search for the most preserved parts of the seeds like fully preserved embryo tissues, which were selected for genetic analysis. We are now in the process of comparing the DNA of the living tree with the DNA of ancient olive pits retrieved from our excavation in the nearby Byzantine settlements. Several dozen trees of this relict have already been planted in a rescue garden in the Negev. We know that wine growing was the main achievement of the Negev ag agriculture, agriculture and that a particular variety of white wine produced was favored as far as mainland, Euro as far as mainland Europe. Not note, for example, this Negev mosaic depicting a camel carrying wine jars and a man holding a bunch of grapes or dates in his hand. It colorfully, it colorfully demonstrates the economic rule of the Negev as an important center for the production and export of wine. Fragments of wine amphora, the wine jugs, 
originating from the Negev, were found as far as ancient Marseille and London in the west, and in settlements along the Indian Ocean coast in the east. Those wine jugs that originate from the Negev portray clearly the trade routes and transportation range of the Negev wine. Other markers of long distance international trade are evident by numerous textile that were recently found in our excavation. These include cotton fabrics, which most probably arrived from Central Asia, and silk that could have come all the way from China. This is, a, this is the first evidence for the Israeli Silk Road. Some of the cotton fabrics have clear dyeing techniques that are characteristics of traditional textile centers that originated in India. The infrastructure of the infrastructure of the international trade is also reflected by other exotic and prestigious organic commodities that were brought across the desert along the network of trade routes which connected the east and the west. Of special interest in this respect is the Red Sea parrotfish, which was a highly, which was a high quality fish, especially valued in the haute cuisine of the Roman Byzantine Empire. The fish remains were found in their hundreds in the fish in the trash mounds of the Negev sites, hundreds of kilometers from the Red Sea where they were caught. Other fish found include freshwater taxa that originate from the Nile and the, and the Mediterranean Sea. Their remains are accompanied, are accompanied with edible shellfish from each of these aquatic habitats, further demonstrating the delicacy and luxurious nature of the Negev cuisine. The delicacy of the Negev cuisine also gave us the inspiration to play with, to play with food, to play with the archeological food leftovers and reconstruct some of the ancient tastes of a late antique meal. To recreate a complete meal, we have assembled together with the renowned Israeli chef Uri Jeremias, a multidisciplinary team of experts in archaeology, history, and culinary sciences. For this project, we applied an experimental approach to reinvent the variety of extravagant taste of fish dishes and accompanying courses. To recreate the ancient taste of the ancient Byzantine meal, we creatively incorporated only the food products that were found in our excavation. The main ingredients of the Mediterranean Byzantine meal include parrotfish, goat cheese, almond, pine nuts and pistachio, olive oil, local herbs, pomegranates, dates, and the well-known Negev wine. You are most welcome to join us in the future for this intriguing journey, which involves also tasting archeology span and an educational concept that we call it from excavation to plate. This event is tentatively scheduled to be hosted by Asia Society Hong Kong in late November. To conclude, in this talk, which we try to demonstrate the utility of the hybrid archaeological approach to explore, reconstruct, and revive important chapters of the lost knowledge of the Negev Christian farmers. The story that we brought focused on wine growing and trade, where each of the main pillars of bioarchaeology is well rooted in our studies. The archaeological pillar was demonstrated primarily by landscape archaeology with its multiple agricultural installation and agronomic facilities. It also included the trash dumps and abandoned houses where much of the organic remains were collected. The historical pillar relied on mosaics and local texts to demonstrate the centrality of winemaking for the people, to the people of the Negev for their consumption and trade. It also includes several external reviews written by European writers 
that praise the high quality of the Negev sweet and white wine. The biology, the biology pillar provided essential information on the type of plants that were grown. CT scans of seeds, for example, were used to distinguish between closely related olive varieties. Finally, the genetic profiling of the ancient grape enabled us, enabled us to identify with some certainty which were the exact heirloom cultivars and search for their closest living relatives. This is particularly important for the native grapes, which provide an exciting story for winemaking in arid environment. In era when we need to adopt to global warming, we also need to expand our search for authentic local ancient breeds that were cultivated and selected for centuries in dry areas. The answer may be found in the Negev. We started this talk by raising the question, why is archaeology important? To answer it, we could have gone in many different directions and bring other and no less important lessons from the past. At the end of the sixth century, the affluent society of the Negev farmers witnessed a sharp decline, as is evident by rapid dysfunction of settlements and abandonment of agricultural activities. The crisis closely coincides with a period of climate change and outbreak of plague. Then, like today, the world was changing rapidly and international market contraction were likely the main proximate cause for the Negev decline. Ever since, the Negev will stay desolate until modern time. The magnificent ruins of this prosperous and unique early Christian agricultural society are important testimonies to the spirit and ethos of the Negev people. Their success, which relied primarily on superior motivation, virtues and aspiration, allowed them to make the, de to allow them to make the desert bloom and to create fertile and sustainable ecosystem in a barren land. Their unique story and miracle success is an important lesson from the past. In a world of global warming and climate change, their entrepreneur opened plenty of opportunities for further exploration of their agronomic success. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the European Research Council, the National Geographic and the Israel Science Foundation for the generous funding of this five years project, and also to extend my great appreciation to all of my colleagues which took part in this fascinating project. We invite you to visit us in the Negev for a first-hand experience of the thrill of archeologic, archeological discovery. We also look forward to meeting you in Haifa and tell you more about our original and first of its kind research center and educational program for multidisciplinary hybrid archaeology at the Holy Land. At this center, archaeologists, historians, biologists, and geneticists collaborating in recreating ancient human inventions that have been lost through time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Baraz, for that really fascinating um, journey back in time. Um, and now I have so many questions uh, to ask you, and, uh, but it's really exciting to see that you're really, um, I think you, one of the questions you asked, the first question, why is archaeology important? And I personally think it's, it's really important that we know where we come from. And, uh, and in terms of uh, the, the, the research that you're doing, um, you know, uh, it's very clear, uh, you know, the, the, where Israel and some of the, the history uh, where we come from as, uh, as kind of a human race in terms of that part of the world and also the interactions uh, between um, the East and West. It goes back that long ago. And, and I'm really eager to find out how did you get started on this project in terms of when did you first um, found the, the, the dump? And 
what got you excited? It, you know, it seems to me it's just the middle of nowhere in the desert. What made you be, decide to become kind of almost like to me, a modern day Indiana Jones um, in terms of looking at the past to understand uh, what's going on? So how did it get started for you? At first, I need to admit, I, I, I was academically raised in prehistory. So most of my research was on the prehistoric men. And it is there where you excavate um, cave sites and you find plenty of the food left of, food leftovers of the prehistoric people. So this is where most of my academic research was conducted until about six years ago. I think it, it came up when I first read The Collapse by Jared Diamond was very much inspired from his book about the decline, the collapse of different civilization. Um, Jared Diamond in his book brings several key examples from Greenland and the Aztec and the Maya and the Easter Island, etc. But all of the examples that he brought were of a kind of a hunter-gatherer or less developed societies. Whereas the case of the Negev is an evident or is, it's a case of a it's a complex society, very much like today. So ever since I, you know, ever since I was a, I was a kid, I was a youth and was traveling in the Negev, it always fascinated me as an enigma. And then maybe six, six years ago, I got the opportunity to start to explore it. I mean, basically by accompanying archaeologists, experts to the period and to the Negev, to accompany them to, to examine, to taste, to touch, the different context and from there the, the research question came but just as a short answer i would say maybe this is one of the missing chapters in a collapse in Jer diamond's seminal book um then tell us then um, one of the things you end is how do they become extinct and the lessons for us today um you mentioned the climate change outbreak of the plague um, it, there's a lot of familiar tones where we're seeing right now. So what do you think are the lessons that we should take from this, uh, what you have uh, researched so far for modern society? Many societies or most societies uh, don't have very deep roots in the past. I mean, you see a, a kind of a... a, a over time, uh, significant changes over time of the different culture and people that live in different, in different areas. So I, I would say that, um, it, interestingly, I mean, in the Negev, when we try to explore the reason for the collapse, the three main hypotheses or the three main basic uh, knowledge was that uh, the Negev collapsed because of climate change, because of the plague, or because of cultural change, is any the arrival or at the beginning of the early Islam and the cultural turnover. We didn't find any of this evidence in our excavation. And more than that, as I show you in the pictures from Shifta, I mean, when you look at the houses, they build the houses, they build the churches, they build the, the public structure to stay there forever. But something went wrong. We still don't know what went wrong. I mean, it's a kind of a, probably we will never know, or, or we need to continue and explore it. We know that, I mean, the plague arrived to the Negev. We know that we didn't find strict evidence for climate change, but others would argue that climate was changing. It's difficult to measure it when you go back in time. I mean, it's raised a lot of debates. I mean, here, I mean, in the humanities sphere, when you look at the data and you interpret it in different ways. But one thing we do see, and that is happening for sure, and that's a decline of trade. So we see changes that if before there were plenty, I mean, grape and importing of wine, as an example, was the main commodity that was moving Along, it just disappeared at the end of the sixth century. So maybe it's kind of, I would say, economy. Maybe the true is the economy, and it goes to question or to issues that relates to demand. I mean, people were at the capability to continue produce the wine, but on the other end, 
there were less people interested in buying it. And can you also now talk a bit about technology? You mentioned, um, I think especially, I find it fascinating in terms of the DNAs of the, the, the plants and so on. Uh, is, do you now have the technologies today to really now have a deeper understanding of, of some of the plants um, in terms of the, you know, the, the authenticity, the ancient plants and the, the varieties? So is the technology you're finding allowing you to uh, look into some of these questions that you've been asking? Yeah, for sure. Uh, the, the pro, I mean, when we work with archaeological material, I mean, we find lots of grape seeds. We cannot plant them and raise grapes. We cannot take date seeds and raise dates. I mean, the material, the genetic material within the plants is very, is very fragile, is very fragmented. It was distorted over years. So the only way to learn about the different varieties, to get to know more, not just that, it, that it's a grape, but which type of a grape, what kind of cultivar. And when I say what type, I mean, what makes it adapted to the negative? Uh, how does it is adapted in terms of uh, building its roots to catch the water of the floods or the size of the leaves in terms of uh, doing photosynthesis when there's so much sun or the, or the amount of sugar in, in, in the fruit? The only way to find out is by reading the genetic codes of those remains. And it's the same like going to the supermarket and using a barcode that every cultivar would have a specific barcode. So this is, in terms of the genetic analysis, this is how, how it works. I mean, since the DNA was completely fragmented over time, was broken to many different small pieces, Bear in mind that we work with, with pieces which are like confetti. Okay, I mean, it was, a, it was a big book, but now it turns into small pieces. And it's, it is there that we search for specific characters to characterize each of the cultivars. And this is the breakthrough. I mean, because we could did it, I mean, we could not did it 10 years ago before we had the genetic map of grape. The same as we couldn't study Neanderthals 25 years ago before we had the human genome. So now that we have all the genes of the different species, the different taxa, it is, the, it, is, it is now our turn as archaeologists to, to bring old material and to start to sequence them and to see how they change over time. I mean, you, you know, you, you go 10,000 10, years in, back in time when uh, wheat was first domesticated and you, you stop in the 50s or in the 60s when you have the specific uh, pasta species, uh, the, specific, the specific wheat species that is made by Barilla for making pasta. But on the way, there's thousands. And I would say, I mean, and I'm giving examples only from my side in terms of wheat, barley, and, 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 and grapes. But it would, be, it would be also, I mean, corn in, in, in America or May or rice in soybean in other places, of course. So this leads to an intriguing question. Uh, can we revive uh, these ancient plants and animals now that we do have the DNA and we know how they come from? So the question is, can we revive them? Okay. Maybe some of you know that as a, in, in biology, there's much research in the last 10 or 15 years to do the extinction, to revive extinct animals. So there's research group working on the extinction of the mammals. There's other groups working on the extinction of passenger pigeon or the dodo or other taxa. We don't do that because, I mean, this is, we work differently in terms of our concept. The idea is that we are not doing really the extinction. The idea is to take the grape seeds, search for specific characteristics, and then go and search for these characteristics in the feral, in the wild. Because we believe that even though 1500 is passed, some of the relics are still around. It would be the same as for apple, for example. I mean, we know that apple were domesticated in, in, in Kazakhstan, in, in, on, on the border with, 
with the uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, not far from Almaty. I mean, this is where you have the origin of Apple. It, it will uh, it will make significant genetic change until it will become the Macintosh Apple in, in the United States or the Fuji Apple in Japan on the other side. But in between, if you go along the Silk Road, you will see many varieties of apples because those people were moving not just the apples, but also the seeds. And they were planting them and they were adopting them to the different environments. And this is where you have lots of, di lots of diversity. So the same as for grapes, you can surge in the apples or along the way, but the idea is, I mean, go back in time. The archeology, span this is the material that provide the background. When biologists work on extinction, they work with extinct taxa. We don't work with extinct one. We just expect to find the relics along the way, along the historical way, I would say. Okay, so great. We don't have to worry about scenarios like Jurassic Park. But it sounds like it. Uh, not, not right. With that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in some ways, what you said is, I find that fascinating, the, your example of apples. I uh, live uh, as a Chinese American, both in the US and, and, and Asia. And I find the one uh, plant fascinating to me is eggplants. Um, and I've seen it in Israel. I've tasted it in Israel. I've tasted it. It's in terms of the size and, and, and the, you know, it, it's, it's still eggplant, but you have short, long, and, and there were, you know, apple is a good example. But for me, it, 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 eggplant has been one of those uh, puzzles uh, where the origin and, but it is also uh, in terms of cuisines around the world and the way that, you know, the, the different usage and so on and so forth. So, so that would be one of my, my, my uh, interests is, is where, where did the eggplants come from and how they evolve? I don't know if you're going to answer. Yeah, no, no, I do. It seems like you, it seems like I invited this question. Yeah. No, I'm in Japan. <laughs> know what I'm talking about in terms of eggplants, right? Yeah, because eggplant tells a fascinating stories like the apple. I mean, we didn't add eggplant in Israel or in the southern Levant or in, in the Middle East until about the 6th or the 7th century, okay? I mean, and the exact time need to be calibrated, but more or less that would be Byzantine early Islamic, the period of Shifta or maybe after. You don't have egg, eggplant before. It, it, it only appears then, starting from the 7th, 8th, 9th century. And when it arrives, it, make, it makes a big change in terms of the agriculture. And this is important, even no less than the apple. And I would, with your permission, to explain it, to expand it in two more sentences. Because the thing is that, I mean, most of the agriculture in the Negev, most of the agriculture in, in, in the Middle East is based on summer crops, which means you do the harvest in the, in the fall. Eggplant... You can plant it twice a year and it can be a winter crop. So when, when eggplants arrive here, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it, it, it's a dramatic change in terms of the way that agriculture is produced here. You start to see the appearance of stocks that, ri that are raised twice a year. And the eggplant most probably arrived from India, or most probably arrived from East Asia. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the varieties of eggplants along the way, but once it arrives here, it's very much different from your eggplant. And uh, some people like it, some don't. <laughs> it's not like apple, you know. I, Either I, you like it or not. <laughs> I just find it, um, uh, the, I'm now really fascinated because uh, uh, you mentioned, uh, and I'm really looking forward to in November, uh, hopefully, we can travel and hopefully we can have you um, and, and Professor uh, Ruben here and everybody to talk about this Byzantine um, meal that, that we are really looking at. So tell us about that, um, th that you've already done similar uh, Byzantine meals in other parts. How, how did that come about in terms of the recipes, um, the people involved? Because that's a really interesting, you know, we're looking back in time through the food, um, you know, that with this, with this meal, which I, I'm, I'm excited to experience. But uh, tell us, how does it taste? How did it, you know, I, I know you, you, we've been working, uh, you've been working with this uh, well-known chef. Uh, chef. Uh, is, so this, uh, in some ways, selfishly, I want to get people excited. So we have something to look forward to um, so that we can have a meal together, but a, a meal like no other meal. It's a, it's a, it's a old fashioned, it, 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 from, really biblical time. So tell us about the, this Byzantine meal. 
Again, I was raised in prehistory. So probably if I would offer you a prehistoric meal, you were less fascinated about it, you know, by eating meal, by eating lots of meats with your bare hands. But like, I mean, in, in the Byzantine period, the other major difference from the prehistoric times is not just the, the reduced amount of meat, but also the existence of historical text. And it's in the Byzantine time that you have cookbooks. I mean, there's even cookbooks that goes back to the first century written by Apicius. And, and a cookbook is a very useful manual because you open it and you say, take this and a portion of that and combine it with this and do it with that. So if you have all the ingredients in the ancient cookbooks and let's agree that we recognized all the ingredients because maybe, you know, maybe I, they have a different name for eggplants and we cannot recognize it. So what we did, I mean, together with my colleagues, which were historians, we went to those cookbooks and, and tried to read and to extract the different the ways the different ways to produce the, the, the food and then we return to the archaeological finds to see if we have any evidence for that so for example in, in this byzantine meal we cooked parrot fish i don't know if you ever tasted parrot fish it's a white meat very much like codfish okay so it's very poor it's, it's very poor with fat it's low fat the fact that it's low fat as opposed to salmon or other fatty fish, it, that is, it, it is easily dried. So we did some experiment in terms of drying the fish. Drying the fish and salting the fish, that was the only way to eat it in the Negev when you are 250 kilometers from the sea. So what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, it, when we combine historical history with the cookbooks and the, and the ancient text, with archaeology, the finds that we found in excavation, and also with some folklore. I mean, looking at uh, the way that people are still, traditional way that people are cooking today, then we could uh, combine all these ingredients to an interesting meal. I mean, you would say if it's tasty. I like it a lot. Um, I had read uh, prior to, you know, doing my homework, uh, somebody described it as a bit like por Portuguese uh, bacalao in some ways in terms of the the way it's uh, dried and salted. So it, so we already have some idea of what it, it, it might be kind of like, uh, but how about some of the other food that are uh, in, from this recipe that might be similar, or is there any similarity with uh, some of the modern, uh, with some of the food that Israel you know, is eating, you know, some of the Mediterranean food, or is it totally different? I understand. First, regarding to the Portuguese bacalao, it's a very good example. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fascinating example because, I mean, the Portuguese are living on the Atlantic coast. I mean, they have access to plenty of fish and the best fish. You go to Lisbon, you go to Porto, you get plenty of fish, but still the Portuguese prefer the bacalao that comes from the, from the North Sea, which is 100 kilometers away. How do you explain that? It's probably culture, right? So, the, I mean, the same would be for the parrot fish. So the, the bacalao is, all, uh, is interesting, but that would be the same as having a parrot fish in the Okinawa market. It, it's again, it's, a, it's a considered as a delicacy. But uh, it, it's true that, I mean, when we walked with the chef, with Uri Buri, with Uri Jeremias, we didn't stick, we didn't strict, work strictly with the cookbook because we had to that it will fit to also to the modern taste. But for example, when we looked at the cookbooks, they use massive amount of salt. And today we are more sensitive to salt. So we played in term, not in terms with the, not with the ingredients as with the quantities. And most all of the ingredients that are included in the meal are the very much Levantine or Middle Eastern, that, that, the, the food that would characterize the Mediterranean diet, which is olive oil, which is wheat, which is uh, which is some fruits, figs, and, and 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 grapes, of course. Which sounds very healthy for you. I mean, f uh, because that's the beauty of the Mediterranean diet in terms of the health. Uh, you know, the, so so I think uh, the health effect um, is something that we're all really kind of uh, obsessed with these days. So I, I hope to uh, perhaps 
we can help you modernize it and make it a new trend to in terms of uh, of this this type of uh, uh, new uh, new old new old food. New old we can bring that to to modern day. But tell us about the wine, the grapes, and uh, you know, were you now able to use that the the the, the grape seeds from before, and now kind of make the wine? Um, and uh, and tell us about that the wine in terms of the taste and and how how has that Tell us about that process. Specifically, I mean, you mean about the old wine, right? Not about the current excellent negative wine. <laughs> but tell us about both. But, are, you know, you, obviously there is a connection. So, the, and the new, be, how are they, yeah, if they are connected? There is a strong connection between, because, I mean, when you deal with wine, you always talk about the terroir, the, the landscape. The amount of water, the amount of sun. I mean, I mean, terroir is is all the physical characters that the physical characteristics that makes a good wine. So we know that the, the Negev was a good terroir for wine in the past, same as it is today. I think that I mean the great. I mean the the story or the, the yeah the story about the ancient wine also give us another dimension for terroir, not just. The, the, not just the modern dimension, but also talking about historical terroir. I mean, and, and it would be obvious for, for us, I mean, to go to uh, northern Portugal or, or to go to Pompeii and, and drink their local wine, which are the local terroir, which are product and have been produced for thousands of years. Or at least for the, from the Roman times, I mean, you have some of the vineyards that were still kept. The thing is that, I mean, when you go back into the Negev, the problem is that starting from the 7th century and more strictly from the 8th and the 9th century, growing wine or producing wine was forbidden in the, in the land of Israel or in the, in the Middle East because of Islam. So because of that, much of the knowledge was forgotten. So they were developing cultivars. They had certain ways to produce the wine, to prepare the wine, to grow the wine, and to choose the specific varieties in the Negev, but all of this was forgotten and it's different than going to Crete, than going to Greece, than going to Pompeii, in terms that those uh, varieties are just disappeared. So then, I mean, the only way to recognize them is with the archeological material. Um, I, you know, what I find your talk fascinating in that um, about two months ago, we, have, uh, we had a professor from Hong Kong U talking about her excavation, her recent excavation in Pompeii. And through the recent discovery of art history, uh, she interpreted, we, we understood a lot more uh, about Pompeii, uh, the Pompeii of then. I think some of the, she gave us the example of the sculpture because of the, uh, um, you know, Pompeii, uh, the ashes and so on. We had just assumed a lot of the uh, artwork and the sculpture are gray, but actually a lot of it are quite colorful, kind of like terracotta soldiers we know in, in China, the original terracotta soldiers are actually quite colorful painted, but the way we see them today, they are um, the way they are because of time. So I think what, what's really fascinating with, uh, with what you are doing in terms of looking back is really giving us um, a, a better understanding of how life and, and diet and, and you know, uh, the dump, I find that fascinating in terms of looking at the dump to understand um, the, 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 how, um, but the, the, tell us more about the, the, the stone door, the, the, you know, how did you kind of stumble on that, but, and then seeing the pattern of it and kind of what you later on, um, kind of came to a conclusion in terms of the, the city or the, the town's extinction from that. Okay. Um, the, the dams, I mean, when you look at the dams, when you walk on the dams, you just you, you just feel that it is rich with organic remains. I mean, these are the you know the material that was removed. I, I mean, when the city, when the villagers were still functioning, people were paying their taxes to move their dams outside. I mean, I mean that was an occupancy of, of several people. I mean, re responsible to remove that. Once the city is collapsed, people don't pay taxes. They don't pay taxes, and then you have the dams destroying in your neighbor, in your abandoned neighbor's house. I mean, this is how it works in the Middle East. It's probably different in Hong Kong. But I mean, so th this is a kind of a rule, a rule of thumb in terms of, uh, if you find dump in a, in a, in a 
abandoned house, it probably does not originate from the people who lived in this house. Okay. And, and, and for the Byzantine period, I mean, the, the fact that they were a kind of affluent society is also reflected by the, amount, the, by the quality of sanitation of the city, the hygiene, the fact that they were moving, I mean, a, a, much of their debris, much of their waste, and including creating those dumps. And when we started to work in these dumps uh, five years ago, I mean, the first time was the Stampus Chalutza. I remember that I felt something like Tony Soprano that I'm doing with, I'm dealing with waste management consultant. I mean, this is what we're doing. We're doing waste management. But archaeologically speaking, within this waste, we, have, we find so much material that could, that, that the interest not just archaeologists, it interests biologists, it interests agronomists, it, is, it interests veterinars. I mean, it turns the dumps, I mean, it, it, we just felt that the dumps is becoming like kind of a, a playground for experts to use, to, to try different methods. I, I mean, because no one tried before doing DNA of this taxa or another. I mean, there's, there's groups, we're not the first one, there's groups working in the, in the world on different areas, doing different things. But, I'm, but what I'm trying to say that it, I, we felt that we are kind of in a playground that we, we could easily attract a lot of experts. The one that is expert on, on charcoal, the one that is expert on pollen, the one that is expert on dating, on geology. And everyone took samples. And then, you know, you have a section and each expert show you the results and you just make the correlation. And this is, I mean, was very kind of an interesting experience. Well, I, very... think, I think what you said about dump is really interesting. It's uh, a lot of this, uh, the records are not written down uh, and from the dumps, you can extrapolate how they live and, and, um, and so on. Because a few, about uh, 10 years ago, I had the opportunity of going to uh, some of these um, sites in national parks in Oregon where they found, um, they excavated uh, uh, dumps and they knew Chinese miners had lived and worked there because they found um, Chinese medicines, pots and pans, soy sauce, cooking utensils. And it's one way of knowing that uh, the Chinese miners, the railway workers were there over 100, 150 years ago from the things they left behind. And because their history were not written down, but from the dump, and, and I, we were there with a national park ranger who uh, happened to be American and his personal interest because he stumbled onto these um, dumps or these sites and he knew um, that Chinese miners were there over a hundred years ago. And it's fascinating. And right now I understand students and uh, especially students who are interested in the history um, in the summertime, they go and look at more of these sites uh, to better understand um, how these miners, uh, we know they left Hong Kong or they left uh, at this part of the world to go to work in um, Western part, uh, whether it's uh, the railroads or the mining. Um, but in terms of the oral, many of them were, did not know how to write or read or write. And so what they left behind in terms of these uh, um, trash is to me um, treasure for um, historians, because, uh, and so that sounds like uh, that's a lot of what you're also doing. But in terms of students getting people involved, um, I know we're going to be traveling again. We, I have to believe we will be traveling again when this is all over. And, and, and I, one of the sites, one of the sites is it, Nangrev. I have been there before, but not to the site. So how can, if people are interested, um, how can they um, uh, come and see these sites? Is it through um, the university or how, and you know, that is something that I know that a lot of people would be interested in finding out more about. So for, uh, first, uh, all, all of you are very welcome. I mean, the sites are in the negative, there are national parks as well. And they are uh, both, uh, by the way, most sites are also World Heritage Sites, declared site by UNESCO as World Heritage Sites. So they're open to the public. And there's a uh, uh, it's once you get to those sites, you can easily tour. I mean, we can think of a way that to collaborate. So the University of Haifa will accompany you and your students. I mean, we will be delightful to do that as a kind of a joint partnership collaboration. 
of course. And what you said about the dams from Oregon, I mean, it's 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 it's, a, it's a very interesting. I mean, the fact that the things that people are throwing away now without paying attention to it, that is like the kind of material that will be used by tomorrow's archaeologists. And um, so, I mean, let's think about it, what we have in 200 years from now when archaeologists will excavate us, especially we're in a, where we, when we're in a period of zero waste. So what do you learn about when you have this zero waste? And, uh, sorry, and... Uh, the other thing is that at least in the Negev, we could find it very easily when we walked in the Byzantine layers, in the dumps, we had pig bones and we had grapes. When we went to the, when we passed and we, on the upper layer where there was early Islamic period, no pigs. I mean, so you, there's always, even if you go back in time, you can always search for, or uh, sacrifice significant, certain markers that would you would search to identify, to characterize the different groups that you're looking at. So it, then it goes back to ethnicity, to the ethos of those people and the, the ethnicity. And that's another interesting, yeah. Well, we're coming toward the end uh, and we're now, uh, we have some questions. Uh, in fact, uh, if those uh, with uh, questions from the online audience, feel free to um, uh, uh, send it on Facebook or YouTube or Slido. Uh, the Slido number is 00716 and happy to uh, answer any of the questions from online. But right now we do have one question from online that I uh, would like to ask you. Uh, it's asked, can we accidentally uh, during the digging uh, bring ancient viruses which were eradicated back to live and create a new pandemic? Um. It's, it, it's, it, it can work in many, many science fiction movies. I mean, The Mummy, etc. I, I think I think the fact that the DNA is so fragile, it, it is fragmented to so many different small pieces. So it's not really active anymore. But still, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of efforts that are put that that researchers are putting in terms of exploring, in terms of studying soil DNA of specific latrines or waste, or even human remains to search for pathogens, to search for germs, to search for viruses, for bacteria. But you don't find the complete genome of each one of them. You find just fragments of it. And that's the main problem. I mean, it, we wouldn't be able to do that. We wouldn't be able to recreate I don't think that we will be able to recreate uh, any of those germs, any of those viruses, even those uh, specific, maybe even the fungi, which are the most resistant taxa on Earth. I mean, you can send the, the spores of fungi to Mars and they will survive, but they will not survive more than 200 years. Because um, again, the, the, all the material is just deteriorate, deteriorating and I don't think that it can happen. I mean, maybe if you're excavating something which is 100 years old, 200 years old, but not if you go back in time and for, for the good one, I guess. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, um, been hosting uh, this last couple of months, we've been talking about COVID updates. And one of the um, questions I remember in February when we asked uh, uh, one of our experts, uh, we were talking about SARS and that was always, um, back in February, we were thinking by maybe July or August when the heat comes, uh, it'll destroy um, the, the pandemic or the virus and obviously has not. So we, we know this, we're living with it right now. But my fascination with, you know, uh, my understanding in, in the um, desert, the heat also preserves a lot of things, correct? Um, in terms of, uh, you know, plants or in some of the um, so tell us about, you know, the preservation. You, I think I'm glad to hear you say 200 years that, that no uh, germs from that will come to, we have enough of our own pandemic, uh, our own viruses today to worry about without worrying about the ancient ones. But in terms of preservation, uh, the heat uh, of, of, of is, you know, the deserts and so on, what is it, some of the stuff they're preserving are in kind of in good shape. I know we've had the, um, uh, we've talked about, uh, we, we have the exhibitions of the Dead Sea Scroll here in terms of like the, the 
uh, papers and certain certain things are preserved quite well because of the desert. And so how about the plants? It sounds like the grape seeds are also uh, preserved quite well. Um, so from that, what are what other things are you finding that uh, are not seen today, but have been preserved because of the um, the deserts of Nagreb? I mean, the desert, the desert is a, one of the best place to search for old biological remains, basically because of its dry climate. The fact that all the material is remain desiccated, I mean, look, for example, the material that has been excavated in Egypt within the pyramids, within the, from the pharaonic period, which are maybe even 2,000 earlier from the mat our material in the Negev. And there, there, you find sacrificial food with, you know, you, you see complete nuts. Everything is completely preserved. It's basically because of the dry area, the desiccated area. I mean, if we could have, if we could have bear ourselves, I mean, we could put ourselves in, 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 in very dry area. And it, I would add to that also salty environment because the salt helps for further dehydration. And the, 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 the deterioration of the biological remains happens very fast. I mean, once you survived, once, once a plant or a seeds or a corpse or whatever survived survive two, three years, it will last, it will survive even a million year. Because, I mean, the first few years are the most important one. And if conditions is well, it's protecting it, it is covered, so there's no sun that would, with the ultraviolet that deteriorate it. And there's no water, so there's no bacteria to, to destroy it. There's a good chance that it will survive for a long time. So I would say, you know, in the past, lots of ancient DNA that research was facing the north, going to Siberia, going to Greenland, going to the Arctic, because their DNA is very well preserved. And we should also turn our attention or also look into the desert area. There's also interesting, a, a very good preservation that occurred there as well. Well, it sounds like, um, you know, we, there will be more things to discover in the desert um, as we um, move on. I mean, it's just that now, uh, thanks to the work that you're doing and, um, and also the university. And um, so I think we look forward to seeing more exciting discovery uh, from um, your neck of the woods in the future. And thank you for sharing this talk with us. And I'm really delighted that Asia Society Hong Kong has the opportunity tonight um, to really learn from one of the, from the experts. And in terms of this field, in, in some ways, this five or six years sounds like really exciting work that you're doing. And we look forward uh, in, this, in November uh, to have you here and to really recreate this wonderful Byzantine meal looking at um, the ancient or the old food and to, to really enjoy the, the food and wine uh, from that era. And thank you so much. And I want to take this opportunity to thank Sissy and thank uh, Professor uh, Ron Rubin, uh, 11th President, University of Haifa, for bringing this program to us. Um, I think although we're all kind of um, locked down or, or being uh, working from home or staying home because of the COVID, we can continue to learn and we continue to learn from each other. And this is a, you know, hearing what Professor uh, Robin has said about um, the connections. I think uh, there's just because we're not working does not mean we, we cannot continue learning. And so this is one of the mission of Asia Society is the connection. We need to continue to learn from each other. Uh, we can need to continue to learn from the past um, because I think we're living in really interesting time and very perilous time. And, uh, and it's times like this that we, I am so delighted, even though you are in Haifa and I were here in Hong Kong and we can still have this wonderful discussion tonight and to learn about the past so that we can shine the light on the future. So again, thank you, uh, Professor Bar Oz, for sharing your time with us and for a really, truly enlightening discussion. And we look forward to seeing you in Hong Kong in no time at all. And, and thank you, our audience, for uh, sharing this time with us. And we look forward to welcoming you back at future Asia Society Hong Kong program. Although we're closed this week, uh, the center, the gallery, we are gonna be continuing to bring you 